Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Today I would like to tell you about a little, like a little bit of a funny topic about finite Fourier analysis. Comes under many names. Careful here, I'm discussing only a particular part of finite Fourier analysis. It's basically a version of Fourier analysis on uh, finite groups. And it's very powerful. There are whole books associated, well, uh, just dedicated to finite Fourier analysis. And of course, in one video, I have no chance to capture all of them. I just want to give you a flavor and an application you can, you can use here. Uh, but first of all, let me just kind of try to recall very briefly what Fourier analysis is in such a way that we will see the analogies to finite groups, I hope at least. At one point, there will be a slide and then we'll make a comparison. Uh, so let's just see. So Fourier analysis starts with this idea that you can approximate a periodic function. So here my periodic function is the square wave function. It will go like this and this and this and then forever. You can approximate it by kind of the usual periodic function, cosine and sine, um, by just using this formula here. So this is really just cosine and sine, just complex. So use some kind of Euler identity to write cosine and sine uh, to hide them in terms of an exponential. Uh, there's an i here somewhere, so this is really just cosine and sine. And you have a bigger and bigger sum of them, you approximate them stepwise, and it gets better and better. Here's, for example, the orange one is kind of the first approximation, and then the other approximations approximate um, this periodic function better and better. Same here, same here. Uh, so here again, the orange one would be the first one, and then it goes on and gets better and better the more summons you add. But it's really this idea of approximating a periodic function by, well, the classical periodic functions, cosine and sine. As I said, just hidden in the exponential, and I'm using the exponential here because that would be nicer for the finite groups in a second. Anyway, so there's a related notion of the Fourier series, which is a Fourier transform, and it encodes all this information as a function if you want. And this is the way how it works. And again, we will see those formulas in a second for the finite groups. So, and maybe you remember the dual group, there was a hat notation. For the Fourier transform, you also use the hat notation. So you can define a different function um, and it's called the Fourier transform by this identity. And again, you just have the X peer and you kind of, uh, in instead of having explicit coefficients, like here, you have the corresponding uh, function here, so, um, and the other way around, it would be, have, would have been the correct one. So f of x is some function and some e, which is exactly like here, f of x are some coefficients and some e, and really just the Fourier transform um, encodes the information from the Fourier series uh, in this nice fashion, having an own function encoding it, and it has this nice property that uh, d d d basically a dual pair. So if you do it twice, you come back to where you started. So you start with some nice function, you can take the Fourier transform, you get another function which encodes the coefficients of the Fourier series if you want and do it once again. So you're kind of expressing now the new function as a Fourier series, the new coefficients will be given by the original function, which is kind of the symbolic. So if you do the double hat, then you're back to where you started. Yeah, so it's really just this dual pair. Okay. Great, so this is kind of classical analysis if you want. Of course, Fourier analysis is super important and has been generalized and is around everywhere. But what on earth does it have to, group, to do with any kind of representation theory? Because that's what we are doing here, right? So let me just recall for you um, that there was a dual group and the dual group was basically the group of characters. So here's my example from Zmod. Uh, so this was Zmod 7Z again, and it's just given by the well, by choosing the corresponding seventh root of unity for the generating character. So the dual group was basically the group of simple characters, which corresponds to the roots of unities. Um, so that's what I explained in the previous video. But you can also think of the dual group. Remember, these were just functions from, uh, in this case, I'm just sticking here with the cyclic groups, from Z to the N to Z. And functions from z to the n to z is actually just an in periodic functions from z to z, right? So z to the n, you just cut out a, a piece of length n and it just repeats itself. And it's just a different disguise of a periodic function. And now you might think, hmm, wait, wasn't the whole point here of Fourier series to approximate periodic functions by standard periodic functions? Yeah, 
So maybe there should be some version of Fourier analysis in the setup of finite groups. Um, so what is it actually? And here, here's how it works. And really just the same formulas, just in a finite setup. So instead of writing infinite sums or integrals, you just write finite sums. Basically, that's what it is. So let me first, so I have the general version up here for a general finite abelian group. I'm not going too much into details. Let's stay with the Z mod N version. So if you have Z mod N, you just take this periodic function and the Fourier transform is defined by this formula. So you have the F of X and you have the X as before and you take a finite sum. So let's have a look. You have the F of X, you have the X and you take an integral. Well. Finite versus not finite, right? The so integral f of x and e to the something, uh, finite sum f of x and e to the something. And there's a Fourier transform, which looks exactly the same. You take the hat, so the coefficients now are given by the hat. You take the e to the something, and that's f of x. And this is exactly uh, this formula here. So you have both formulas in this setup as well. And they satisfy exactly the same properties. So they form a dual pair, and everything is real, is really nice. And the correct interpretation in forms of characters is explained now um, because, well, this group is actually isomorphic to itself. So the dual is isomorphic to the group. And you can actually formulate everything as up here uh, using the simple characters. So here the Fourier transform coefficients stay the same, but now you run over the simple characters. And it just happens that in this case, the simple characters are given by the corresponding x function. That's just what it is. And uh, that's just what you use. That's how it works, right? Fourier analysis on finite groups, finite abelian groups, you can generalize that to non-abelian groups. You need to be very careful. Non-abelian groups have not trivial characters. So you need to be careful how to do it, but you can. Um, but anyway, for finite abelian groups, it's really powerful. The same formulas and that's in classical Fourier analysis, just kind of finite versions instead of integrals and so on. So in some sense, it's actually even easier and it's explained over character theory in the dual group, which I personally find is a cool statement um, just on itself, but it's actually also very powerful. So there are plenty of applications. So if you open one of those books on um, finite group Fourier analysis, you'll find zillions of applications. One of them is this funny statement. I find this, first of all, it's a surprising application. I'm not going to show you how it works. That's, that's too far off, that gets us too far off track, but <laughs> it's a very funny application. So it actually, uh, it's also a very funny statement. Uh, here's the statement. So if you take a graph, and every graph is a matrix, but just using the adjacency matrix, but just uh, connect vertices uh, by an edge whenever there's an, uh, an entry in the adjacency matrix. So you can calculate the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix. And eigenvalues in general have no reason to be real numbers. Why should they? Um, but eigenvalues of Cayley graphs are always real numbers. And that's not really super easy to see. Uh, and it's a funny application of finite Fourier analysis. So here's the Cayley. So this Cayley graph is a bit boring. So certainly you could show for those Cayley graphs much easier <laughs> than uh, that these have uh, only real eigenvalues, but it's kind of true in general. So this is the Cayley graph of this eight element group. So we have eight elements. Uh, the different generators here of the three copies act by red arrows, green arrows, or blue arrows. And this is how the Cayley graph looks like. And if you put this into a matrix and calculate its eigenvalues, um, then you will see only real eigenvalues. And that's true for, for all Cayley graphs of finite abelian groups, which is uh, very surprising. And you could prove that using finite Fourier analysis. It, the proof is not so hard, uh, but it's, it gets off too far off track. Um, anyway, so finite Fourier analysis on finite groups. Well, that's why it's called finite. It's like, like a discrete version. Sometimes various variations are also called discrete Fourier analysis. The literature not always uses the same terminology here. Anyway, so let me just call it a Fourier analysis on finite groups. It's kind of cool concept, like periodic function uh, expressed in terms of standard periodic functions and standard periodic functions are simple characters. And then you do a Fourier analysis on them and it's actually pretty applicable. Um, so many applications are known, like this funny application to graph theory. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will talk to you next time.